Hey everybody, I am here with Rodrigo Copetti, somebody who's created a blog that has detailed a lot of consoles in a very awesome way, and I'm really excited to talk to you. So welcome, Rodrigo. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I've been following your work for a while now, and uh, a couple of times, uh, friends of mine have mentioned, hey, you know, how come you never uh, interviewed Rodrigo? The blog's awesome. And I, every time I'm like, yeah, I know, I got to email him. And then I I don't know why I always forgot. So I'm glad you're finally here because uh, you've done a lot of amazing work chronicling these consoles. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not very active on social media. I tend to put you know, only updates when something new happens on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's just my personality or, or, or just the way I happen to run things. But um, yeah, I also received some mail about people thinking that I call my Twitter account abandoned, stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. because I don't post as much as I, the average should. I'm not sure if mm. that's the correct way to define it. But um, um, yeah, I'm still alive. I, <laughs> I, I, I post from time to time. Um, and yeah, any, any time somebody sends me something on email, I'll try to answer as soon as possible. So I guess that's how we are meeting now. Yeah. Um, so now your your technical overviews, anybody that's ever read them, it's very obvious that you're not just copying and pasting from other sources and putting it into one thing. You're doing your own research. Um, you're really digging into a lot of these consoles. Um, how did you get started doing that? And could you talk a little bit about how how you create these awesome things? Well, um, so I started the website when I was a student at university. And uh, one of the things that I liked to do in my free time was reading about, you know, that consoles, especially the older ones. R right now, you've got a lot of overlapping with PC and other common models. But before, the hardware was used to be so special that I really liked reading and seeing how developers had to struggle with uh, creating a game for a very specific console, like with the Nintendo DS with the dual screens, dual CPUs, stuff like that. So I thought, how do they manage uh, taking into account all the constraints that all the hardware had? Um, so I started writing down all of that, and then I realized, why don't I just make a writing out of it? So the first reason was for me to remember all of this. So I like to read it, and I, then I like to remember for the future or, or check it out after a month or so, because it's very easy to forget. You have to read very specific facts. Um, so I started noting down on a paper, and then I also had a bit of a, an idea. I wanted to have a personal website about something. Mm -hmm. Then I start digitalizing all these notes here, and then it grew up to to be much more, a bit more sophisticated. You got diagrams, you got sections, you got a clear structure. It took time, though. If you see the first time I published a website, it was only shared to friends. Um, it was a list of like bullet points. Fact one, fact two, fact three, and then a couple of links at the end saying, you know, I got this data from here. I didn't <laughs> discover it by myself. I guess uh, as I continue reading about it, investigating, I, I, I managed to make my own conclusions. So I add them in the writing. But I think the most important stuff ex explain, oh, the most important information explained in the articles have to be sourced somewhere. Uh, because I think right now I've got 22 articles. And I didn't have, you know, I didn't spend 20 years investigating this. It was, <laughs> right. was a lot of information coming from 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 other people, which is, um, it's really nice. It's really um, motivating seeing how many people like to document this stuff because a lot of people have spent a lot of free time uh, investigating by themselves and then publishing results. So what I I think with the website, what I try to do is also have a bridge between the most simple information you may find about a console. I guess the first point of um, the first source might be the Wikipedia. Wikipedia doesn't have to be very technical. And then you've got developer manuals from the other side, um, um, information published by hackers about very specific components. So I tried to make a bridge here for people from many backgrounds that want to understand the technology in a way that you don't have to be very knowledgeable about it, but at the same time, you want new information, you want something precise. It's just a general fact that you know could be shared among many other places and doesn't really specialize about the hardware you're reading about. 
That's funny. There's so many similarities to what you just said in the origin of retro RGB. Just, you know, starting out as a small document, not really pub published to many people, and then eventually turning into it's using other people's research to create your own research. And it's kind of funny to see how um, how your site's basically, uh, you know, it's funny to see how, how many people go through the same things, even though you might be on a different subject. And we're, we're both talking about retro gaming, but um, it, it's, it's kind of funny to see how many people go, went down that path, but it's always very clear who actually does research. And of course, you know, your research is always going to be, and my research is always going to be based on other stuff that's out there, but it's very clear who actually does the work and who's just copying and pasting. And, uh, the details that you get into in this, the diagrams and stuff like that, it's, it, they're all really interesting reads and it's, um, it's a really great source of info for all of this stuff. And I also love, you know, I have the same thing is you want to put the technical information there, but you also want to make it so that anybody could jump in. And even if they don't really get the technical stuff, just keep reading because, you know, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. So yeah, I like the way they're laid out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I have a confession to make. I, I think before, I'm just checking the dates here, but I think before publishing my first article on my website, I knew your website before because I, I, you see that my age is not really described that I, it doesn't tell that I like old consoles. Um, I think people told me before, but you don't look like the generation from that, from this Nintendo, Super Nintendo era. What are you doing here? Mm. <laughs> but, um, I did like a, a, a game called Airbound. Um, mm -hmm. I used to play as a kid, even though it was, I think, 20 years after it was released, something like that, 15. Anyway, the thing is that game has to be very expensive for some reason. Now everyone wants it. There's not a lot of copies. Uh, but I eventually found one copy here in Scotland. So I live in Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. And that, may, that was a very good excuse for me to get a Super Nintendo, because I never had one. I only could play through emulators. Uh, so I got one, but I didn't know how to make it work on a modern TV. So that's how I eventually found your website. And I realized I went down the rabbit hole you know, very deep. Because if you want good quality with the Super Nintendo, you had to you know, spend good money on cables, but also you got the scalers, and you also got <laughs> specific models of the Super Nintendo. <laughs> um, that's funny. You know, it's um, there's a lot of people in the younger generations getting into this, and there, there are some similarities. Like for me, some of my favorite songs were made long before I was born and my favorite cars were some of them were made before I was born. So there's no nostalgia. I just saw it or listened to it or heard it and just thought, oh, well, that's really cool. And there's definitely a lot of that. But with video games as well, there's there are so many giant differences like latency for fighting games, uh, boot times, downloading, you know, downloading patches every time you load up a new game. So there's always new people coming into the fighting game community that are younger that are going in to play Street Fighter because they could flip a switch, start playing immediately. And if they're playing on a low latency display or even the CRT, then they don't have to worry about all that stuff. So it's kind of interesting to see the newer generations get into the get into all the good games for all the same reasons we still play them just because they're they're good games same reason you listen to old music because they're good songs so yeah um, um, oh sorry no no, no it's uh, you know it's always there's always a delay with these uh you know it's uh, as good as the technology's gotten and uh you know that we're unfortunately going to step on each other now and then and hopefully most people have just gotten used to that's the way it is with uh you know over the air recording like this but um i was just going to ask um what originally got, put that super nintendo in front of you was it a friend or a family members was it something that you sought out like that that game that you were playing uh you know that was even 15 years before you were uh, you were a gamer you know, how'd you get it well i this i'm just remembering my 12s 13s mm -hmm. um i remember playing super smash bros a lot i'm thinking where are these characters coming from and they were really good series in YouTube. I mean, this is YouTube pre 2010, so that's a long way back. But um, there was very good um, compilations about. I think there was a channel that show where each item or character or effect came from the original game. And okay. um, there was some references about Airbone, and I thought, wow, this looks like an interesting game. It looks very old, but I one of the qualities that I really like about games is the music. Um, so the plot mm. is a nice thing, but the music 
for some reason tends to captivate me more. I mm. I I convince myself that the plot is worth following because of the music. So I That's think awesome. those games got really good music and that made me continue, even though the graphics weren't as spilling as the ones you got back then. I mean that was the PS3, the starting of the PS3, Xbox 360. So I guess mm -hmm. um, kids were interested in other things. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that it's, it's a bit frustrating seeing how last consoles, like I'm talking not PS5 or Xbox Series, but the Xbox One and PS4. I remember buying a PS, uh, um, an Xbox One, leaving it standby for a month and then coming back again and having to wait an hour to download updates another hour to download the game updates and i thought wow this uh, it's really frustrating to see that we came all the way to you know the press and after all these advancements in technology to to ha finding yourself in in the front of, uh, of the tv waiting two hours until you can play again uh, and yeah. so that's that's one excuse to to go back and turn on the super nintendo <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's um, it, it, it's it's a frustration that everybody in modern gaming shares, uh, and it's funny because while it's annoying, it is what pushes a lot of people back to retro stuff. Sometimes, even just back to the Wii, uh, yeah, basically just back to the Wii because you could still just put your disc in and play if you wanted to. So, it's uh, interesting to see. But um, so what was the next kind of retro console you played you know super nintendo was your gateway drug if you will but what was the next one that uh that you decided oh this is cool i want to try to look into this one now um well you mean uh, with respect to the website to analyze in the website or in uh, general in general like growing up you know was it something where you just went right from super nintendo to something else or was it just then you got a little bit older and you know got to university and then you started looking back well um so i get the thing is during my life so i, I lived right now i live in scotland back then i used to live in spain when i was a teenager and there was a period of rough you know, the economy was not going very well. And, you know, you weren't thinking about buying new consoles or, or buying new stuff in general um, during that era. So um, back then I just had a Wii, I remember. Then I got, then I, 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 what I did was selling my old console and buying a new one. So after Wii, there was a PS3. And then that's, that's as far as I went. Uh, and also the same with the DS. I sold it to get a DSi, and then uh, yeah, that was it. So I I did experience a lot of was able to get a lot of the hardware in my hands because you could still play an emulator, right? Well, PS3 wasn't that developed, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, you could still get a lot of retro consoles, so NES, Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, all those. You got plenty of emulators to play in your PC. You didn't have any excuse not to not to try any game. But it wasn't until I went, I started living in the UK and got a job, you know, had money, and then I could invest into into trying out consoles that I didn't have a chance to 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 fiddle with, and that's also having the the website at the same time gave me a good excuse to you know get the real hardware, start taking pictures, getting more materials to to talk about the website. Um, I think the last console I had to get was a Master System because. Um, I did the article about the master system, and there were so many interesting facts that I wanted to see by myself. Um, I think the, one of the things with retro consoles is the music, the, the sound they make is really unique. Right now, mm. you've got recordings, um, the sampling uh, techniques. Uh, but back then, there was a physical chip generating that noise, that tone, and you couldn't really replicate it anywhere else uh, because that chip, the, the, the nature of, of having that system made it unique. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good reason to still um, buy retro consoles, right? Yeah, that's a, that's such a good point. And that's, uh, that's what made, uh, you know, there's a, a, a quote that I always get wrong, but it's basically, you know, when you're limited to the tools that you have, 
you have to then explode the creativity in order to really get the best out of it. And I think that really happened on a lot of old retro consoles. Soundtracks on all of those, I mean, some are terrible, but some are absolutely amazing. And the Master System, especially if you've heard any of the FM sound games, some of them sound amazing. Some of them are unfinished, so it's kind of funny to, to hear the tracks the way they are. But, it, it, you know, the Master System has a bunch of very cool soundtracks for that stuff. And so do the, you know, the NES and Genesis, of course. But I, I don't know why the, the Master System was always a console that I, I was kind of fascinated by because we didn't really have many around where I grew up. My neighbor had one, which is the only reason I knew about it. And I, I think that mystery was part of the reason why i always liked it as a kid but the soundtracks were always great for the games that i had too so yeah i, I think the master system also had the a piece of both worlds so you got um, the psg style so those fixed tones and then you got the fm chip where you could do a bit of more composition try to engineer your own sounds mm -hmm. which i think it was very painful for developers I think seeing the theory behind FM synthesis, which is the the, the, the engine behind those chips, really makes you think, wow, you, you, developers or, or probably music composers had to go through a lot of headaches to get, you know, the, the from from what they had, what they got in their mind to materialize through these chips must have been really painful. But um, they managed, many managed, right? And yeah. That, and that's a good accomplishment. That's why we're still talking about them, right? Absolutely. When you were researching these consoles, was there any facts that you stumbled across that really surprised you, especially, you know, after you've already done a couple of them and you kind of had an idea of what to expect? Yes, definitely. I think every single console had one fact that I remember finding out, writing about it, and then, you know, finishing for the day and thinking, wow, this has been a, a very interesting discovery. I wonder if present technology continues. Yeah. I'll, I'll deviate for a moment. So um, the reason I'm doing all these writings on my personal side is to be able to understand present technology, right? There's no way, I don't think personally, there's no way that one can analyze very complex present CPUs or GPUs or whatever all the hardware. At, at the same time, ignoring previous developments because you, how can you make the connection? How can you know the the reasonings behind why do you have what you have in the present? So going back to your question, sometimes I, I, I find really interesting facts that have conditioned the way we see technology today. And you think, well, this hardware was supposed to evolve like this, and it turns out there's a very unique feature and it carried out, and that's why everyone is using that feature. Um, I think one example is the Xbox 360, the, the so-called unified shaders on the GPU. Right now, every you see GPUs nowadays, it's, it's assumed you'll find that technology uh, in every GPU. And I didn't realize the Xbox 360 was actually the pioneer of, of it. Hmm. Um, and, and, and the company, I think, RT, really make a gamble with this because it was they developed this technology and and they push it on the xbox 360 for the first time and they also risked everything risked a console market and their own company to to into pushing this not knowing what will happen i guess i guess they they knew it was worth it that's why they push it but um it makes you think um i i, I didn't realize the Xbox 360 will have that 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 starting point. I thought it would be another GPU card that happened to be very famous, and then everyone started adopting it. But um, I mean, you could say the same for the PS3 with the CPU, how how the CPU was constructed, which was like a um, very paralyzed um, cluster of of tiny CPUs inside. Mm -hmm. um, they, they really, I think IBM and, and, and Sony wanted to push that to make it mainstream. Um, I think some of the ideas carried forward, others weren't really that feasible. Um, yeah, I, 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 I feel it for the developers who had to go through that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about 
completely different architecture, like the jump from the PS2 to the PS3. It also kind of makes you think about like the Sega Saturn and how uh, Sega was just like, oh yeah, I'll throw a second chip on this board and we'll make it more powerful. And you know how many developers barely even utilized the second chip for anything, and because it was just a completely different platform to learn on. So, yeah, I think it also has to do with the tools uh, developers have available. If you got really rough tools. And you got a, a deadline to meet. Um, things get very complicated, and the quality starts decreasing because you need. It's always a deadline which will give you the money to continue funding the company, right? Mm. So if the tools are not in a good state, and you need to do a lot of learning, you need to do a lot of um, workarounds to get the the, the product from you. Yeah. So I guess in the way it works is designers decide what. The game should be, and then developers materialize that. And if developers struggle with that step, then that's that's why you get problems like the Sega Saturn being known for being very complicated. Um, I think when things started evolving, so not only hardware but also the compilers and the also the documentation, I guess um, there was less resistance from developers into bringing a good quality. Uh, so PS2. Mm -hmm. We all know from from my childhood, it was very, you got tons of games, tons of options, and games, many of which were very good. I didn't expect the hardware to be very complicated because I always thought, well, if the Saturn was complicated how and, and that didn't go well, how did the PS2 done so well if the hardware was uh, very special? Um, but I guess it's a combination of things. So Sony knew how to execute that. Um, they, Engineers knew that that was the future, and Sony knew how to make that happen. I think. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's a, a good point, and it's it's interesting to see how some of these consoles have, have aged, and how we look back at some of the technology inside them. And the one thing that, for me that stands out about the PS2 is that most of the library is 480i. And it's probably one of the uh, it's probably the console with the most 480i only games. I don't know, it definitely is because there's a ton of games on there. And what an interesting time to, uh, for the video world, because right about that time where everybody was slowly starting to move over to 480p and up. So it's this console that, you know, it was so awesome and so powerful. But I wonder I wonder if it would have aged slightly differently if Sony had made it kind of like Xbox did and said basically everything's going to be 480p and and kind of pushed that side of it as well. But or maybe it just doesn't matter because it sold 150 million units, so clearly it didn't matter then, but I'm just wondering how we would have felt it aged differently if they made slightly different choices. Yeah, I guess you have to gamble with the adoption rates. So if you got a console that has to last seven, eight, ten years. Well, ten years a bit much, but uh, let's say seven years. And you see that there's a transition in the market from one style of video to another one. Would you risk it at the so your your benefit would be that the picture quality will be better. But mm -hmm. that would mean but the drawback would be that not everyone will be able to see it. So that you will lose um a market. Um so I guess Sony decided to play safe. Um, they, you just start with a common denominator. Um, curiously enough, going back to the Xbox 360, um, I think they, they, they did support a wide, a big wide range of video signals just because they knew we were in the middle of going from analog to digital, but not, not everyone could. Um, I don't know in the United States, but I remember in, in Spain, at least in my case, I still had the old CRT still going through analog during that era. Um, it wasn't until a couple of years later. So if Sony or, or, or Microsoft would have gone all the way to digital, then they would have lost a lot of um, kids buying the console. Well, kids' parents. No, I, I completely agree with that. But I also love how even the Xbox 360 supports all the way down to standard definition resolution. So everybody was covered. And I could be wrong, but I think the Xbox 360 supports the most amount of resolutions for any dedicated console, not a, a PC, obviously, because there's a long list. I mean, they have everything from standard definition to PC monitors 
to you know to LCD and CRT PC monitors to all the way up to HD. And uh, even the first revision of the 360 didn't even have an HDMI output. And so just Microsoft really did a lot of very awesome things with 360. And, uh, you know, other than the red ring of death that so many of us had to deal with, I think it was, you know, pretty awesome how they approached it. Yeah. Also, you've seen the size of the cable, right? Yes. That 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 is another thing that engineers have to gamble with. So if you want to support, you can support infinite number of signals, but, you know, the size of the cable will be also um, um, interesting. Just yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, I wonder why they did that versus just putting ports on the back of it. I wonder it must have been an overall cost cost saving cuz that mm. was kind of the thing with uh Genesis and Super Nintendo and actually most of the consoles back in the day that supported RGB, a lot of the components for RGB were in the cables. And if you start thinking about 20 million consoles sold, it's very easy to think, "Ah, oh, it's only 30 cents worth of cables." or worth of components in that cable. Why didn't they just put it on the motherboard? Well, that's millions of dollars over the course of that time period. So it's, you know, it's easy to understand why certain design decisions were made. So I'm sure that somebody at Microsoft just calculated that making your own proprietary connector, dumping all these signal types in them and making your own would be overall the most cost, efe- cost efficient over the years. But it's still funny to see that giant connector. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think that until HDMI was widely adopted, the, the, the business of creating a, a, a global standard for video signals, I, I don't think that was ever a complex, right? Because in Europe, we've got different styles of connectors. You've got the SCART, uh, you've got the normal composite. Um, but, and then if you're, a, if you're developing the, the motherboard of that console and deciding, uh, deciding about how, how do you want to transmit your image to the TV and you see the wide range on on worldwide how how different households do it, then it's a bit of a chaotic um, situation. So I guess they they thought the best way would be just to create your own proprietary connector, try to bundle a couple of signals that were deemed acceptable. It's curious to think that during the nineties they put a lot of RGB, but that wasn't widely used. And in yeah. fact, they started removing it afterwards. Right? Then Nintendo sixty four then. Re- you got Super Nintendo full RGB that that and, and the Mega Drive, amazing, right? And then mm-hmm. the Nintendo sixty four started removing it, and I thought, why? If you're we're coming to that area where you can start, you know, putting that signal directly. Yeah, yeah, especially on the first couple of motherboard revisions, where it was, it, I mean, the the cost to add that would not have been very much all things considered so it's weird that they removed it especially when they have an entire target market that they could have just bought a cable and pl- two actually you know japan with jp21 and then europe you know those two markets combined i thought i would have thought would have been enough to justify it but i guess they just said it's not worth it so even on like on the super nintendo mini um you you don't even need another amp you could if you wanted to get a little bit better video quality but you could just reroute the signals through the amp that's already on the board in order to re-enable it so it's well you know they wouldn't even run extra traces and put a couple of components on there so it's interesting to see the cost cutting and and the 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 total analysis for what they think is the right thing to do yeah but also you had back then the target was kids and i think kids would would have distinguished between what's a real green or a or a or um corrupt the green or a mixed up you know the colors and... i don't know i was a pretty nerdy kid when uh, right. you know we would always if there was a composite video port available we would use that instead of rf we knew enough to at least try the better qualities and i remember at one point getting an s video cable for it because i saw it in a store somewhere. or maybe it was right when ebay first started when I first joined eBay and I saw that they had S video cables, I bought one and I think I had a Super Nintendo Mini at the time and it didn't work, but it worked on my brother's N64. So, you know, we 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 knew to use the better signals and you could see a difference. So, it wasn't that common, especially when we were much younger and definitely didn't have the money to spend on a cable. I mean, if you're a little kid and you're, you know, I used to mow lawns when I was 10 or 11 years old. It's probably illegal now in the States, but I would go knocking door to door and ask if it's anybody needed their lawn mowed and I'd save up money to get a new game. And if I had a choice between playing an RF uh, or upgrading, playing an RF and buying a new game or upgrading a cable and keeping the same games, I'm always going to choose the new game. 
So it was uh, as a kid, at least. So it was that does make sense. Yeah, I guess I have to say that I think the United States had it easier when it came to video signal options. Um, first of all, the 60 hertz um, display rate, that's mm -hmm. much better than 50, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about the NTSC PAL duality. We can leave it outside for now. But um, I think in our case, we had the option to use cards. I think Nintendo was selling a couple of SCARS cables, but nobody knew why you would need... Well, in my case, when I was a kid, I'm talking when I was 11, mm -hmm. You see in the manual say you can buy the scar key, but there can be a better signal. I never seen the the picture on a composite and think, well, why do I need it? I just I'm seeing Mario jumping. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, so when you out of all these consoles that you've done write ups from, what is there one that really stands out to you? Do you have a, a favorite? Uh, a favorite post that you did uh, you know a new favorite console now maybe after researching it you you know decided you liked one more than you thought you would or anything like that um i think you'll see by the length of some articles that i some of them some of them are seven thousand words long others are mm. 25 so i'm looking at the xbox 360 one um i think that one i really had i was really motivated while writing about it because there were many areas that I wanted to 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 research and to to give my conclusions. Um, so you got the GPU, which had the uh, unified shaders, you got the CPU, which it was a bit more orderly designed than the PS3 one. So the PS3 was very innovative, but also was very easy for develop. Well, you needed a lot of work to be able to fully utilize it. So the Xbox 360 one proposed a, a different approach, which was the multi-core uh, model, which also happened to be one of the first ones to to use it on on on, on general purpose hardware. But this was a console, but uh, computers back then, w not all of them were fully multi-core. So that was another model that they it just expanded everywhere. So seeing how these ideas get into just adopted on other industries is really interesting to see. So the Xbox mm -hmm. 360 one had a lot of these things. Also the user, the operating system they got and the user interfaces evolving every two or three years. And uh, you got different, you got the blades and now you got a, how do you call it? The, the different screens one. I think I wrote it somewhere, but my memory is, is, is betraying me. But uh, oh, new Xbox experience. Yes, yeah. that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I forgot it too. I was thinking like I know I can visualize it in my head, and I, I agree. It was weird to see the the massive change in UI over the years for the same mm. console. Yeah, and that's really interesting from a study perspective. So, if you study human computer interaction, you have to see how users interact with a with with a user interface. Seeing that drastic evolution that Microsoft did over the lifespan of the Xbox, so we went from the Blades to Xbox new Xbox experience. And finally, the, the whole Metro style um, that got uh, influenced by the Windows phone interface. So we're also doing phones as well. Um, so it's really interesting study to see how, how they wanted to direct users into using their console. Hmm. It all started with online. I think it, the main focus was gaming and multiplayer, Xbox Live. And then it went to more services. Now you got... Um, I think Netflix got into got incorporated as well. Um, so you got multimedia apart from games. Um, so yeah, gave me a lot of uh, content to 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 write about. Um, however, away from the from the modern ones, I think so. The NES and the Master System one. I liked the fact that I got it side by side. So I got the article in the same structure. And you were able to compare side by side how they differ, and I, I think it's on my roadmap to to expand it actually because I really want to talk about a lot more about the sound system, mm. um, because you can you can put a spectrogram, uh, which is a, a way of plotting the frequencies that are produced by the by 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 a recording. So in this case, you can record the NES sound or a master system sound and put it into this visual representation, which is called the spectrogram. And you can see a strange, pat um, interesting patterns forming um, 
um, that differentiate the two. Um, and it's it's really curious to see that your ear reacts differently depending on what you see on that graph. Um, because you see sound waves, but then you see what your ear um, likes or doesn't like. If the when when you when you when um when a sound chip produces a, a very sharp wave, something like a square, but a very sharp one, your ear doesn't really like that. It sounds unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And I really like to connect the feeling with the what the the the, the science. Um, yeah. I didn't have a chance to to study too much in, at university because I did computer science, not um, I don't know what the career would be about sounds, um, probably sound engineering. Mm -hmm. So that's a space I'm always eager to uh, learn more about. Yeah, and that's why projects like MD Fourier are so important because there are people that definitely prefer some sounds over others. There's definitely people whose hearing, even at a younger age, isn't as wide as others. So you could hear. Um, I definitely ran into that quite a bit when I was mixing my album, where um, even though I was older, my hearing still had a wider range of frequency than some of the other band members. So I could hear all the stuff that was kind of coming out as noise. So that's why in the video game world, or, or even actually in all of analog audio, I'm really digging MD Fourier because now it's able to actually have a, a completely objective way of comparing two different audio sounds. So you don't have to sit there and go, I think this one sounds better. That's not the purpose of MD Fourier. I mean, when you're tuning your own stereo at home, yes, make it sound however you would like it. But for analysis like this, it's been one of the most helpful tools, second to the 240p test suite. So <laughs> um, it's funny too that you talk about the UI stuff because it's always... It, it could absolutely make or break something. And there's been products that have been sold that are fine, not as good as others, but have way better UIs on them to make you, as your experience is starting, it feels like a better experience. And it's also kind of interesting to see how some people lose touch of that. I think the most mainstream example is uh, when Apple first launched their, their gaming app, I think the person who uh, who designed it felt that to them gaming meant playing pool so the app was green and looked like a pool table and it's they they completely missed their target audience there their target audience were younger people buying iphones that grew up gaming gaming wasn't to, i mean I, I like playing pool i'm not talking shit about it i'm just saying if you have a digital app on a phone where you're buying game software people aren't going to a pool hall to play video games so it's you know they completely missed the mark on that one uh, it's just kind of funny to see. Or when somebody has a good UI that just starts to get convoluted because they keep adding features without thinking about, hey, when we started this, it was supposed to be an easy, welcoming experience, not a power it up and you're bombarded with a thousand things flashing at you. So it's kind of interesting to see. And I, I wish more, you know, it's very common in the dev world for developers to just hate anything to do with UI. Oh, it's useless. This product's perfect as is. Why do I need to put some colors on it? I mean, look at the Mr. Project. It's it's basically like, you know, in the 80, late 80s, early 90s DOS to get into the game. Uh, and it, it's it's just not their priority, which is fine. I mean, I'd, I'd, if you have a choice, I'd rather have accurate hardware emulation, but um, it is just such a big deal. And it's funny to see how some people don't get it or lose sight after a while. Mm. Yeah, I think... There's some companies that put a lot of studies to find the perfect formula to develop a UI. If you've got a very um, complex um, product that has to be managed by the user, sometimes companies put a lot of money into UI and then you see how, I guess in the case of Microsoft, they evolve it uh, very drastically as they realize they could improve it in some ways. Um, also, in the case of Apple, they just... You know, I think what you were the 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 interface you were talking about was before the skeuomorphism. That's the. I, th that's the, I think so. I, I think so. It's been such a long time. I, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. mixing that stuff up. Um, and then they yeah, but they change it. You know, they flip it around, right? Um, yeah. With the new interface. Um, yeah, and then you see the mister, which is supposed to go straight to the point and allow advanced users to fully control what they want to do with the device. So the interface doesn't have to be fancy. 
just needs to display the right content and the right controls. Um, that also saves performance um, because if you don't need fancy colors, then the CPU is not very busy displaying, but also doing the control, um, doing the management you you are asking it to do. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a nice duality, right? That's that's why I like to write it sometimes on the website because I don't think there's a there's a better or worse. I mean, you can argue, but um, it's a it's a nice thing we got many different approaches and they target different things and they approach things differently. And then you from the outside can study them and see, oh, they did really well on this and the others did really well on this. So in the future, somebody will want to use a bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's, I mean, in the context of what you're doing, seeing how the interface has evolved over the years, I mean, you didn't have an interface back in the day, but title screens of games, you know, in-game menus and stuff like that, like start menus and stuff. Seeing the evolution to, from where it started to where we are now is pretty interesting. And it's kind of funny to see, you know, just back to your original point that you made at the beginning was, you know, you can't really create something brand new for a market without looking at the past and the present and it's it's kind of interesting to see how things have evolved and what what has stuck around and what keeps changing and sometimes just goes back to the original anyway yeah well it did happen now right with them um, with ps4 and xbox one they all went to a pc architecture mm -hmm. so consoles used to be the innovators in hardware you know bringing new designs out of nowhere to to specialize in gaming. And then suddenly they 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 just adopted whatever the PC market was doing. Well, they obviously changed it a bit. I don't want to say something I'm sorry, you know. But um um yeah, and now it's difficult to find a clear line between a very uh, a, a PC that you make for gaming. Say you 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 build your own PC, you buy the parts, you buy the CPU, GPU very different it's very difficult now to draw a line between the differences between that and 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 the last consoles you got except the switch which which is closer to a tablet really um, yeah but it's a good tablet but that's a good thing right because in the case of the switch people may say well it's just a tablet right but if you compare an android tablet now an android tablet must do uh, many things it's a general purpose device, so it has to run a spreadsheet. You need to check your mail. You need to open the browser. And that consumes a lot of resources. Uh, Nintendo just grabbed the hardware and said, we just wanted to play games. I don't think there's even a browser now, right? They took it away. Um, Might have been, yeah, because there's no point. In it. it's, um, that's why dedicated devices end up sometimes just being so much more useful. For me personally, I almost never game on my PC because it's just a distraction. You know, I'll get an instant message from somebody and, you know, or I, I'm sitting here with my keyboard and mouse and it just, I'll be, I'll start to play a game. I'll remember something I was supposed to do and I'll just, all right, well, let me come back to the game. And then I don't, I just keep working. So that's why when you have a console experience, that's your dedicated thing. Same thing with gaming on a cell phone. You know, it's a, uh, they've gone a long way to not have messages fully interrupt your gaming experience, but th they're still there. So it's kind of harder to, to sink into a game on for me personally, I'm not saying that's for everybody, but it's kind of harder for me to sink into a game uh, on a device that's not a dedicated gaming device. Yeah. Also, big worry if I receive a call on my phone and the game is blocking that call. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Or worse, if you uh, you think it's an important call and it's just some other scam call, like uh, like I get 10 times a day these days. So. <laughs> oh, oh I did. Yeah, I, I used to have those, but then it stopped. I think they sorted out probably my phone company or something. Didn't know it was still a present thing. Oh, yeah, it's it's a huge problem in the U.S. It's terrible. It feels like it got way worse. It got better for a little while and then worse, but I don't even know where that comes from. Uh, so what's next on your list? Do you have another console that you want to do a write-up on? Are you going back to edit anything? Do you have any other projects instead that you're working on that are kind of interesting? Like what's What's the next step for you? Well, that's a good question because I finished the 3DS one and that was one of my most complex articles that I ended up writing. Um, unlike the Xbox 360 one, which I felt um, motivated and that pushed me into writing, you know, 
happily. The one with the 360, I ended up having lots of blockers because I, I was missing essential information to continue my the development of the article. And that frustrated me in some many, many, many times. Uh, luckily, I, find, I found really helpful people around um, who helped me. But I was, when I finished it, I said to myself, wow, this, I, I cannot really spend that much effort into this because I will end up burned out. So um, for my next list, I I got three different routes. Um, I can go through the, back to the retro, or retro, I guess the 3DS is a bit old now, but more retro, like 90s. So I like to talk about the Neo Geo, for example, mm. the, the home console one, because the Neo Geo is really interesting. Be, um, every time I, I analyze an article, I say, well, the CPU is limited, but that's because it was meant for households. So they couldn't afford 1,000, um, a chip that cost $1,000 um, or pounds uh, because they had to be affordable. With the Neo Geo, that didn't happen, right? They just put the most expensive hardware in, into that, and, and the results are really interesting. If you got the money, then you, you see this amazing picture. Um, 2D picture, right? Um, so that's that's interesting to analyze from that point of view. Uh, I could also continue through the modern consoles. So I still got to talk about the PS Vita and the Switch. And that uh, would be an interesting route because I just finished the 3DS one. And the 3DS had a CPU called ARM11, among all, other CPUs, which do other things. The, ARM, the, the next ARM who created uh, designed that CPU um, on the following years, they created other chips, which happened to be in the PS Vita and then on the Switch. So it would be nice to connect the dots here by talking about the other consoles. Um, the third route is to go for a more obscure consoles. So for example, the Playdate. Um, mm. The Playdate has, I, I, I just checked the documentation. It's, it's, it's interesting to start investigating. Um, the CPU is from ARM, so that's good also to connect the dots here. However, I couldn't get my hands on a play date because apparently they are they are out of stock. I tried to mail them and they told me, well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a while or something like that. Um, that was some weeks ago. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's one constraint. So, you know, three different things here. Meanwhile, while I still design, I got lots of maintenance to do in the, in the site because when you see the diagrams positioned in a way, you see the text, the layout of the website uh, uh, has been programmed by me. And sometimes I, I, I look at the code and say, wow, this is really, it should have been better. You know, in, should I put it in this way so I can maintain it better? later yeah that's so, you're yeah. describing all of retro rgb all of the pages now every time i look at them I'm like i need to delete everything and redo it this is not how i like the flow anymore and it's yeah it's painful to go back sometimes and, and you know but it, it's impossible to start right you can't start a project without just doing it you can't think i'm going to make it perfect before you start it so you just get the info out and then you try to find time to go back and retweak it but i know i feel your pain for that one <laughs> yeah yeah so, yeah, I think it's going good still. I I do have a full time job, so I'm not always available to you know spend that many hours that I liked. But I but it's still I still find some free time, and I still want to continue with this. Um, so yeah, that's um, awesome. Good, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, at the beginning, uh, you said you're not really active on social media. So obviously, I'm going to be linking to your website. But is there any other place um, that people uh, could interact with you? I think I've seen you on the, the SMS power forums, at least, right? Oh, yeah, that was a long time ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, that's, that's when I before publishing a, an article, because I do the study, I Try my own conclusions. I add the diagrams and everything, but I don't publish right away. I try to get a lot of feedback before, well, as much as I can, because I'm not interested in publishing for a deadline. I'm more, more interested in publishing with good quality. That so the first impression is the right one, you know. Mm. And so I normally, when I talk about a console and I found that a forum is specialized in in 
in the hardware of that console, like in SMS, the work for the master system. When I finished the, when I when I'm almost finishing the uh, the article, I present myself on on those forums and I say, "Hi, I'm working on this article. If anyone um, like to check it out and tell me what they think, that would be great." And it's and with the master system that was that forum, but in others, I normally frequent in Discord, and they've mm. got many channels there. I'm really amazed at the how selfless people are in helping this. Um, it's really, really motivating. Um, knowing yeah. that a lot of people. Yeah, there's so many really, really good people in the scene that are just a pleasure to work with. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's very easy to just see the negative stuff and think that's everybody, but it's actually the minority in, in retro. There's so many cool people that are just as interested as we are, so they just want to help and, and kind of do all this stuff with us. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. To answer to your question, I, I'm still. Available on Twitter. Um, the fact that I don't tweet one time per week doesn't mean that I'm not there. <laughs> um, but uh, I encourage people to send me mails. I, I got the my email address. That's how you find me, really. So yeah, it's right on your website. So so yeah. Um, also, so I'm I'm still here. So even though I'm not making my presence in some social media, it doesn't mean that I'm not there. However, um, another thing that I wanted to mention when you when you when you mentioned the, the the bad things about so so you get good feedback and you also may get bad feedback somewhere. I publish my articles also on GitHub so people can criticize them. So anytime the curious thing about my website is that anytime someone says a criticism about you know you didn't do well this section you got all those facts wrong um, you know this is all wrong. I said fine. I got my article here. Feel free to criticize me as much as you need because I like that. <laughs> I like to get mm. the article right. I don't mind being wrong. Uh, it's, some, it's something that I tend to repeat to people who who send me some some con- constructive uh, <laughs> <laughs> that constructive criticism. I don't mind being wrong. If you if you got lots of comments to say to me, please put it on GitHub so everyone else can see them as well, and we can have a chat about it. And I'm happy to repair the the content as much as i need i mean yeah it's, it's supposed yeah. to be an, a place for information not an ego or something like that personal uh, yeah anyway it, yeah i know i know what you mean yeah yeah that's <laughs> i i always appreciate feedback too and it's um the, the only thing that it's kind of funny for me is a lot of people don't wrap their head around the fact that if you come into a discussion guns blazing screaming and yelling most people aren't going to take you as seriously as if you're like, Hey, you got this one wrong, cool article and everything, but you know, here's some facts. Here's where I, here's how I know this is wrong. You know, do you, and even if, even just that is more than enough. And I, I'll always take feedback. Um, I always listen to feedback, but it's, if so, people just take a moment to have a conversation, it's always well received, at least on my end, it's always well received. It's only when people come in just, you know, throwing out all these crazy accusations sega's just paying you to write about the master system you don't even care about this thing and it's like how am i going to take you seriously <laughs> even if you were right so it's uh so yeah it's a constructive criticism be a human being about it and i uh, i'm i'm all for it as well i just want to get things right yeah i mean there will be always someone criticizing you there's no way to avoid that yeah. right yeah, anybody that does anything public facing at all has to just come to terms with that. They also just have to come to terms with the fact that some people are going to just hate you for no reason. It's just you have to either just be okay with it or just never post anything publicly ever. So <laughs> it's just, you know, it's uh I don't I just you got to I came to terms with it a long time ago and I'm I'm okay with it. I do my best. The people that know me know that I do my best, so that's all that matters to me. You know, I'm always trying to get better too. And hearing people like you who've done so much good work also say like, Hey, I just want to get this right. It's also, it's always nice to hear, you know? Well, um, thank you so much for your time. And of course, thank you for all of the research and all these posts that you've done. I've enjoyed every single one of them. Uh, I don't think I actually got to the 360 one yet, but I read every other one of them and it, uh, it, they're all excellent and they're just such great resources for people. So yeah, I appreciate all your time. You're welcome. Don't forget to take your breaks because I don't, I, even myself, I cannot 
stand there and read what I wrote a year ago that is 30,000 words long and just one go. Um, it wasn't meant to be like that. You're, you're, yeah, some articles I put, this is very long. You know, grab a coffee or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much. I'll, uh, you know, I'll post all of your info. And uh, obviously, I'm a fan and I'm going to keep reading your stuff. So thank you again. Yep, no problem. Thank you for having me here. I, I'm i surprised. I, I knew your website many years ago. I didn't know we will end here. So that's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you.